Okay. That's okay. Holiday. Right. Okay. Right now. Ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, and assembled company, wherever you are in this big, wide world. And whatever time it is, welcome to the World Storytelling Cafe. And it's our children's night. Or, as we like to say in the World Storytelling Cafe, it's Louis' night. And there's... <laughs> And we have as our teller tonight, the amazing, the wonderful, the effervescent Hannah Brailsford. Put your hands together. Over to you, Hannah. Thank you, John, very much. So, stories now. I'm sure you all know that stories are everywhere. Right now, there are stories right above us in the air just flying around so I need a little bit of help because we need to catch some stories for tonight don't we oh uh, yeah so Louis are you ready to help me and everybody else are you ready to help me catch these stories oh yes yes we are fantastic Helen. I think we need to do a little bit of warming up though because I don't know about you but it's quite yeah. cold where I am so I need to warm I'm, myself I'm, up I'm a little mine. bit I'm mine okay so the first thing we need to do is put our hands up like this and we need to give those fingers a wiggle because they're going to be needing to catch that story in a minute. Now, I can't see your feet, but right down there are my feet down here. So I'm going to just yeah. shake. That's it. Brilliant. Excellent. That's it. Shake those toes around and those feet around. Brilliant, Louis. And anybody else who might be watching on Facebook, give those feet a nice big wiggle there on your sofa. And now we've done our hands. We've done our feet. But there's another very important thing we need to do. We need to wake up our ears, don't we? Because otherwise we're not going to hear the stories. So take those ears. Now, John's got very small ears. But if you've got nice big ears, you can give them a really big flap. Give them a big flap. So that we can wake those ears up. Fantastic. Now, there's another little thing. That stories can sometimes be really smelly. So I think it's always good to wake up our nose as well. So just give your nose a bit of a, a bit of a wake up and then a bit of a sniff. <sighs> can you smell anything really nice? Oh, can you smell your dinner cooking? Oh, I do. Can you smell, is it good? What are you having? Yeah. Cottage pie. Oh. Oh. Oh, oh what a good for a cottage pie. Oh. If only there wasn't a lockdown, I'd pop round and have some cottage pie with you. That sounds delicious. I can smell it's it though from here. It's with broccoli and carrots. Broccoli and carrots. And oh. carrots. And right. carrots. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Right, well. And gravy. Now I've got gravy yeah. and carrots and broccoli in my nose. There's one last thing we need to wake up, which all stories need. We've got to wake up our imagination. So, just... Give your head a tiny tap just to wake up that imagination. Get it really bubbling away. Fantastic. Now, I'm going to listen very carefully and see if I can hear a story coming our way. Yes, I can hear it. Oh, I can see it. Louis, Louis, oh my goodness me, it's, it's in your room. I can see it's just behind you, Louis. And it looks like it wants to come this way. So are you ready, Louie? Because it's going to fly over your head. Anybody else, wherever you might be, you will find that there is a story somewhere in your room as well. And after three, we're going to try and catch that story and hold it really tight. So are we ready? After three, one, two, three. It's flying! Catch it! Oh, Well ducked there, Louie. Fantastic. <laughs> that was a fast flying story. Right now, I need you, John, I can see you've got a bit of it in your hand. Fantastic. I need you to blow it really hard at the screen to me and I'll see if I can get it, okay? Oh. Wow. Blow right through the airwaves, all the way to Essex. Let's see what it... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Told you it was a fast story. Goodness me. Oh, well, should we see what it is? I have a feeling, actually, it 
it feels like it's a oh it might have a bit of that oh that lovely cottage pie oh i can oh yes it's just oh it's definitely a hungry story once a long time ago in a village way up in the hills it was nearly december not quite but nearly and the first snow of the winter had come and it had laid itself onto the mountain and it was beautiful well it was beautiful to look at but for the people in the village it meant well it meant that there wasn't an easy way out of the village and soon the market began to run out of food because all of the merchants couldn't bring all of that lovely food all of that broccoli and the carrots and all of those potatoes to make their lovely cottage pie they couldn't get up the mountain to the village to bring it to the people so it was starting to look quite difficult for the people how were they going to eat now the villagers they decided that any food they had they needed to keep hold of and so they started to collect all of their food and hide it away they hid it underneath their beds they hid it up in their cupboards anywhere where nobody could see because they were worried that their neighbours might start knocking on their door asking them for food. Well, that was everybody bar one house, the smallest house in the village. And there there lived a mother and her daughter. And they were very kind indeed. And they, they would share their food with the rest of the village. And so you can imagine, very soon, they were running out of food. Because the rest of the village were like, yes, give us some of your carrots, give us some of your broccoli. Well, one day, when the girl was coming back from delivering things to all of the villagers, she came across a little wizened old man with a huge grey beard and a, oh, well, I think he had a red hat on. Oh, and I think he had a, I think he had a lovely cloak too. And uh, it's very strange, John. He reminded me of you. And he was, well, he was more wizened, John, because you're not wizened. You have beautiful, delicate skin. But he, he had a stick just like you, John. And he was sitting. He was sitting on the side of the road. And he stopped the girl and he said, excuse me. I've been sitting in the snow for so long and I'm really hungry. I wonder... Do you have anything left in your basket that you might be able to share with me? The girl looked in her basket and she only had two carrots left. Two carrots that she promised she would bring back to give to her mum so they could make some soup. But she looked at the man and she thought, he looks like he needs the carrots more than me. So he gave, she gave the man the carrots. And Louis and everybody else. Then the most amazing thing happened. As she handed over those carrots, the man suddenly seemed to grow taller. It could have been because he stood up, but as he stood up, he looked enormous and he looked somewhat, well, younger. In fact, he looked identical to John. And then he produced from underneath that cloak a bowl. And he said, you have been so kind. I don't have any money to give you in return for your carrots, but I will give you a bowl. Take that home. And all you have to say is cook, pot cook, and you will have a delicious 
cottage pie for you. And so the girl was very confused. It was just an ordinary pot. But she took it home to her mother. And she told her mum all about meeting the, the, the man on the side of the road and that she was sorry, but she gave him the last of the carrots. But that he said that the pot would make their dinner for them. Now, I wonder if you came home and you said to your mum, I met this man and I gave him the last of our food, but he gave me an empty pot. But he said, don't worry, it's going to cook the dinner. Whether your mum would believe you. Well, maybe she would. Maybe she wouldn't. And this girl's mum, well, she wasn't sure. She was sitting in between the two. So she said, OK, well, let's test out and see if this pot will make us what you said it would. And so they put it on the table and they said, now I need you to help me with this. They said, cook, little pot, cook. Suddenly, the most delicious smell started to rise up from the pot. And then there was a bubbling. And when they looked inside, they saw cottage pie. <gasps> well, you can imagine. The mother was delighted. And they sat down and they ate that cottage pie. And it was delicious. And so the next day, they decided, well, we'll see if this little pot can make us something else. So it came to breakfast and they put the pot on the table. And what do you think they asked the pot to make for them for breakfast? What would be a nice breakfast to have? What would you have, John, for breakfast? Oh, I'd, I'd have, I'd have a, a full English, I think. A I'd like, full English. I, I'd like, I'd like sausage, bacon. I'd like a hash brown. Actually, I'd like bubble. Hash brown's a bit transatlantic. I'd like, I'd, I'd like bubble and squeak. Bubble and squeak. And, and, and a fried egg. And bacon and fried egg. Well, and tomato. Strange you should, strange you should say that, John, because they fancied exactly the same thing, and so they put that pot on the table and they said, cook little pot cook and they thought about that full english and then suddenly there was a wonderful smell oh and then there was a bubbling and there in the pot was a full english breakfast well you can imagine that was delicious absolutely delicious and then it came to lunchtime and they thought well it would be rude not to ask the pot for something for lunch and so, what do you think they asked for lunch? What would you have for lunch? So, a sausage bap. Sausage bap. Brilliant choice. So, they thought hard about that sausage bap. The perfect sausage bap. A really nice big sausage and a lovely flowery white bap. Maybe with a bit of tomato ketchup. And they said, what did they say? Can you remember what they said? Cook. Pot. Cook, little pot, cook, exactly. And suddenly the smell of that sausage, oh, and that bread, and there was a bubbling. And there, in the pot, was the most delicious sausage. Well, this went on for quite a few days. Until, finally, the little girl remembered that her and her mother hadn't been delivering any food for the dinner. So she said, Mother, I think really we ought to go and, and give some of this food to, to our fellow villagers. I tell you what I'll do. I will ask the pot for some vegetables, for some broccoli and carrots and potatoes that I can take them to the village. And so that's what she did. And she put them in her basket and the pot had produced them. And she said, Mum, you look after the pot and I'll deliver them around the village. She went out to the village to deliver all of that lovely vegetable. All those vegetables. But while she was gone, her mum was getting a little bit hungry. She thought to herself, I just want a little snack. Just a snack before dinner. But what? What 
shall I have? As a little snack. Mmm. Something delicious. What could it be? A cookie! A cookie! <gasps> a great big chocolate chip cookie. That's what I really fancy. Mmm. Well, just ask the pot. I'm sure the pot will give me a cookie. And so the mum, she put the pot on the table and she said, cook, little pot, cook. And she thought about that cookie. And as she thought about that cookie, she began to smell those chocolate chips and there was a bubbling and suddenly there was a huge cookie there in the pot. There in the pot was that cookie. But that cookie didn't stop. For you see, there was one thing I didn't tell you. Every time before now, when they had wished for their dinner or their breakfast or their lunch, they'd always remembered to say at the end, thank you, little pot. Now you may stop. And the pot had stopped with just enough food for them. But this time, well, the mother forgot. She was so busy chomping on that cookie that she forgot to tell the pot to stop. And so the cookie, the cookie kept coming. First there was one cookie, then there were two, then there were three, then there were four, then there were five, then there were six, then there were seven, until the whole of the little house of the girl and her mother was filling up with cookies. Mother started to panic. Oh, no. Oh, I can't. I can't remember. Oh, my goodness me. Um, pot. Uh, a pot. Uh, no, no more. No more cookies. I only wanted one cookie. I've got to think of my waistline. Oh, no. No, no, no more. No, 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 no. That's enough. That's enough. Please, please. No, no, no. No more cookies. But the pot didn't stop. The pot just kept making cookies until the cookies were, well, they started to push against the door of their little house. And finally, <coughs> the door fell down and the cookies began to roll out of the house. They rolled out of the house and they started to roll into the streets and then they started to fill the streets. And by this time, the poor girl's mum, she was taken away on a sea of cookies down the street. And all of her neighbours started to come out and they, they couldn't believe their eyes. For there was just a sea of cookie on top of that crisp white snow. And it kept coming. Cookie after cookie after cookie until the whole of the village was filled with cookies. And just as the girl had finished delivering to the very last house, the very edge of the village, as she turned round, that great big sea of cookies met her feet. What's going on? And there was her mum holding the pot. I can't make it stop. Well, the girl took the pot from her mother and quickly said, thank you, little pot, but please now you must stop. And instantly, the last cookie popped out of the bowl and the river of cookies stopped. Well, you can imagine a village that had been cut off by the snow, that had had, well, it had had food because of the kindness of the little girl. But now suddenly, they <coughs> had streets full of cookies. And what were they to do? Well, what would you do if your street was full of cookies? They started to eat them. All of those villages ate and ate and ate and ate. They ate until their bellies were full of cookies. And by the time they finished, they were very full indeed. 
And I don't think they ever wanted to see another cookie again. But they also realized something else. They realized that this young girl, she could have kept that pot all to herself, to her and her mum making the food, whatever food they wanted, never sharing. They realized that she had shared all along. And so when all of that cookie was gone, they went underneath their beds and into their cupboards and they took all of that food that they'd been keeping and they threw the most amazing feast for the whole village to say thank you. And from that day on, they all shared the magic of that pot. <laughs> now, how do I know that story? Well, I know that story because a traveller told me that story. And it's funny that you should mention sausages because that traveller, that traveller had been told that story as he had gone a long, long way along a road on his journey. For he came to that little village and they told him all about their pot and they shared a delicious meal with him. But as he left that village and went on his way, he came to another village down in the valley. And there he heard another story. And this story was very strange indeed. For he heard this story from a young man called Louis. Now Louis told this traveller about a strange thing that had happened in the woods one day. It had happened to one of the people who lived in the village. It was the old woodcutter. And it was just before the snow had fallen that had cut off the mountain. And he'd been in the woods on a cold, early November day. And he'd taken his axe and he was about to chop down a tree to get some wood for his stove and his hearth and also to take some wood to market to sell, to buy some food. Now, he took his axe and he walked through the forest as he did every day. And he would, this is what he would do. He would go up to a tree and he'd put his hand on the tree. And then he'd listen very carefully. And he'd think to himself, now, is this tree ready? Is this tree ready for me? And if he felt that the tree was speaking to him, then he would cut the tree down. If he felt that the tree had said, it's okay, it's my time to be cut down, then he would take his axe and he would cut it. And this particular day, he had found a fine fir tree and he thought, this will be a good tree to cut down. It had been growing in the woods for a very long time, so he put his hand, you can put your hand on the tree. They had a little listen. You can hear anything. So he put his hand on the wood. But he was feeling quite tired and he thought to himself, well, it hasn't said I can cut it down, but it hasn't said I have can't. So I'm going to cut it down. And it feels, it feels about the right time. So he took his axe. Now I'm going to need your help. Now, John, I know you're strong, so I know you'll help me. He took his axe ready to chop that tree because it was a really big spruce tree. It had been growing for many a year. And he took his axe. Fantastic. He took his axe and he... No! He was about to, John, but he then suddenly heard something. Stop! Please! Don't strike! 
Now, in all the years that our woodcutter had been listening to trees, he'd never heard a tree say that. Or in quite that way. But he stopped. Maybe I'm hearing things, he thought. <sighs> Definitely ready. Okay, here we go. So he took his axe once more and he was about to swing and he went... Oh! This is my home. Winter is coming. Please don't chop down my tree. And then the woodcutter saw that there in a little knot in the tree was a very, very small. all dressed in green, a fairy of the woods. She fluttered out and she said, oh, please don't cut this tree. I've been living in it for years and it's nearly winter and I don't want to move home. Not when the snow's on its way. Please, just leave my tree. And if you do, I will give you three wishes. Well, the woodcutter had never met a tree fairy before and he was, well, he was quite shocked and, and quite delighted. And so he said, well, very well, I won't cut your tree. Three wishes, you said? Oh, yes. Just say, I wish they will be granted to you. But use them wisely. Well, sir, the woodcutter was very pleased indeed. And he wanted to tell somebody about the fact that he'd met a, a wood fairy. And the first person who came to mind was his good wife that would be at home waiting for him. And so he completely forgot about cutting down trees. And he turned round and he rushed back through the woods back to his house. And when he got there, he was so excited about telling his wife about the tiny little fairy and how he'd got three wishes. But all of that excitement and all of that running through the woods home, well, it had made him quite hungry. And as he walked through the door, he couldn't see his wife anywhere. And what's more, he couldn't see or smell any sign of his dinner. Oh, oh I'm really hungry. Oh, I wish I had a sausage right now. And suddenly, there, on the ground, was a great big fat sizzling sausage. Mm. And as the man, the woodcutter, looked down at his feet and at that fat sausage, suddenly his wife came in. Did you get the wood for the stove? I need to make the dinner. What is that on your feet? I think it's a sausage, said the woodcutter. A sausage? What's a sausage doing on the floor, on your feet? And where's my wood? And of course, the woodcutter quickly explained to his wife about what had happened in the woods, how he'd, he'd met this little fairy and this fairy had granted him a wish. And when he'd come in, he was feeling hungry and he might have just happened to have said that he wished he'd had a sausage. And, and now he did. You wished for a sausage. You wasted a wish on a sausage, a sausage that I can't even cook because you didn't bring any wood back. Oh, you foolish man. I wish you had a sausage for your nose. That's how silly you are. Well, what the fairy had forgotten to tell the woodcutter is that this wish was not just for him, but for his whole family. And so, as 
house, the woodcutter stood there. That sausage disappeared from his feet and suddenly replaced his nose. And now, there, between his eyes, above his mouth, in line with his ears, was a great big sausage. What's happened to your nose? said his wife. <gasps> what have you done? You wish my nose was a sausage and now it is. I can't believe you. What am I going to do? I'm going to be the laughing stock of the village. I can't go out. People will see me with a sausage for a nose. And what good is a sausage on my nose? I want a sausage in my belly, not on my nose. Well, at this point, the woodcutter wife looked at her husband and she thought, we've got one wish left. And really, I'd quite like to wish for a, a nice, a nicer cottage. Maybe with roses round the door and a, oh, and, a, and a stove that lights itself and isn't reliant on my husband coming back with wood. Oh, and, and a, a dinner that cooks itself every night and maybe a house that just cleans itself. But then she looked at her husband and she thought, oh, very well. I wish that that sausage wasn't on your nose, but instead was on our plates, along with some nice gravy, some broccoli, some carrots, and maybe a little bit of milk. Suddenly, the woodcutter felt, and sure enough, his nose was back to normal, and there on the table, of their little house was the finest sausage and mash dinner that either of them had ever had. Now the woodcutter never saw the fairy again, but he didn't mind, for he had had a wonderful dinner. And it was only his wife that regretted a little bit that she hadn't left her husband with a sausage for a nose and got a lovely cottage instead. That is the end of the tale that the traveller told me. It's made me quite hungry actually, John, I have to say. Goodness me, cookies, sausages, Oh, cottage pie. I wonder if we've got time for one quick story. What do you think, John? I think we've got time for a little bit of mm, pudding. Should we have a little bit of pudding to go with our lovely dinner we've had? What do you think, Louis? Yeah. Well, now what would be the best pudding to have? What would you have? Chocolate sponge. Chocolate sponge. Well, it's a good thing you chose a chocolate sponge because I know a story about a chocolate sponge. Yes. And guess what? It was that very same traveller that told it to me. For you see, on his journey, after he'd left that village in the valley, he came to another town. And in this town, there lived a giant. And with that giant, there lived his wife. And this giant's wife, she loved to bake. She would bake cakes and cookies, but her favorite thing to bake was chocolate sponge. And she would make the best chocolate sponge. And she would make it just in time for when the giant 
there he knew that every day after a long day out at work he would come home to the best chocolate sponge in the whole world. Now there's a special secret to making chocolate sponge. First of all you need a great big bowl. So have you got a great big bowl? You haven't got a great big bowl? See if you can find a bowl anywhere, a nice big bowl. Or if not, perhaps we can make one. We can just make one. That's it, fantastic. Maybe with a cushion or with our arms if you haven't got a cushion to hand. Brilliant. And now we need to put some things in to make this amazing chocolate sponge. The first thing we need to put in is some eggs. How many eggs should we have? Let's have ten. Ten giant eggs. So this is a giant chocolate sponge. Now we need to break those eggs into our chocolate sponge, into our big bowl. So this is how we're going to break our eggs. We're going to go splat. We've got to do that ten times. So here we go, are we ready? Hello. Splat. 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 Have we got to ten yet? I've lost count. Let's put a couple more in. We might have gone to ten, but I'm not quite sure. So just in case we haven't. Splat. Splat. There in the bowl. The delicious gooey giant eggs. But we need a bit of flour too to make our sponge. Now we need the giant flour shaker. It's this big. And the only way to get the flour out is to give yourself a shake. Now come on John, we need to do a bit more than that because it's a giant amount of flour we need to get into that bowl. We can't just put the flour and the egg. No, we need to put some butter in there too. Now being a giant sponge, we need a great big slab of butter. A huge slab of butter. And the only way to cut this butter up is with the knife. No, not a knife. With a sword. Yes, that's what we need for such a giant slab of butter. We need a night sword. Now, I'm sure like me, you've got a night sword or a brave princess's sword just lying around somewhere. So take your sword and we are going to chop that bit of butter up very quickly indeed. <coughs> and splat it into the bowl with our flour and eggs. Now John was ahead of me. He'd already taken his giant spoon. So take your giant spoon and give that all a nice big mix. Ah, oh, fantastic, but we need to put a bit of sugar in there because it's got to be a nice sweet chocolate sponge. So take a little bit of sugar. And in your most magical way, set it into that bowl and then take Take some chocolate, some cocoa, the finest cocoa from the finest cocoa beans. And we're going to grind those beans. We're going to get that cocoa powder and we're going to put it in to our bowl. Oh, look at that. That's making a delicious sponge. We're going to stir it round. And now we're going to put it in to our giant oven. So we need to open the giant oven door. And then the giant bowl we're going to put in the oven. Such an amazing bowl. Everything can be done in it. And then we're going to close that oven again. And we're going to put the timer on. And we're just going to wait. Oh, I can, I can just imagine that beautiful chocolate sponge getting ready to bake and bubble and be ready for the giant's dinner. Oh, but as we know, the best cakes take just a little bit of time. 
but this is a giant's cake. It's a magic cake, so it's almost done. <gasps> Take the cake back. <coughs> Of course, make sure you use oven. And there, there now, just like the giant's wife, you have the most beautiful chocolate sponge for your delight. But one day, when our giant, when our giantess, she was making that beautiful chocolate sponge, Instead of putting sugar in, she took a different jar from the shelf. And in that jar was fairy dust. Fairy dust collected at dawn. Collected just as the sun was rising. It was very special fairy. But to our giantess, it looked just like sugar. And she put it in her chocolate sponge and she put it back up and she did all of the things that we had done to make that chocolate sponge. But when you put fairy dust into a chocolate sponge instead of sugar, what do you think it might do? What do you think it might do? What do you reckon, John? I think I think it could I think it could make my complexion beautiful. Oh, it could indeed. It could make your complexion very beautiful. But it could do something else, John, as well. Could it shrink me? I'm afraid it could. I'm afraid it could make you very tiny indeed. Tiny with a beautiful complexion. And that's exactly what happened. When the giant came home and he sat down and there before him was his favourite chocolate pudding, just as it always was, he took his spoon and <laughs> made that lovely noise as he tucked into it and that's the giantess who every day waited to hear her husband say, that's the best chocolate pudding in the world. Her husband had disappeared. The giant had disappeared. And instead, there, underneath a giant spoon, was a tiny little giant with the most beautiful complexion going, please, get the spoon off me. Get the spoon. She rushed round and she picked the spoon up. She said, oh, oh, oh no, what have I done? Well, it didn't matter that her giant husband was now tiny. He had a beautiful complexion. And she could have travelled off to find a magic potion to make him big again. But instead, what do you think she did? What do you think, Louis? Did she make him big again? Did she make him big again? Well, because it's you, Louis. I think we can make him big again. But how are we going to make him big again? What are we going to do? How is she going to make him big again? Could she go back to the fairy dust? I think she could. And instead of making the most delicious chocolate food, instead she took that fairy dust and she made, what would she make? What do you think, John? I think I think a, a nice a nice tagine, yeah, like, like 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 in uh, like in Marrakesh, I think. Yeah, a nice. Yeah, one, of those, one of those beautiful pots, I think. 
oh yes yes a beautiful tagine and she said rather than having dessert tonight you will have proper dinner and so she made a beautiful tagine and she sprinkled in the fairy dust and then she took her smallest spoon and she fed it to her tiny giant husband and right before her eyes he appeared again back to his normal size <laughs> and they did laugh about it <laughs> But from that day on, she was much more careful about which jar she took down from the shelf. But between you and me, now and again, just for fun, she put the fairy dust in. But she always turned him back again. And that is the end of the story of the giant and the day he shrank. Well, thank you, Hannah. That was marvellous. I'm now incredibly hungry. Yes, me too. Yeah, I am. I, I, <laughs> yeah, me uh, too. Uh, me too. Yeah, yeah. Is, is your cottage pie nearly ready, ready Louis? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Well, as... uh, well, wait a second. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm. I'm thinking it's. It's definitely time for dinner, John. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, 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 my my shopping's just done. <laughs> oh, it's ready. Sorry. It's ready. It's oh, brilliant! Fantastic. Minutes, so, yeah. Thank you, Louis. Oh well, I hope all of your dinners are ready, and I hope that you might get cottage pie or chocolate sponge, or a nice big sausage bat, whatever it is you're having tonight, <laughs> have a really delicious dinner. Dad. Yeah, I'm just a, I, 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 my, my neighbor has just delivered the makings of my, of my dinner. There we go. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's the little girl and her pot, you see, John. They've delivered yeah, well, that, that, that's it, that, that's it. <laughs> uh, well, fantastic stories. Next week we've got Deborah Weller from from Guys, the from the have USA. A look. Have a look. Oh, oh, oh my oh, goodness! I want it's some. Been, it's been presented with the most delicious <laughs> pie. Well, you have a lovely, you have a lovely meal, Louis. Bye. 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 I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, John. Right. Bye. Have a, good, done. have a good week. Bye. Yeah. Deborah uh, Weller next Friday from from America. Who? Deborah Weller. She tells who's, stories and who's sings he? from America. Who's there? What, what's her name? Deborah Weller. Okay. Uh, okay. With time. With time on Friday. You, uh, usual time, six o'clock. Okay. See you then. Right, bye. Enjoy your bye -bye. Bye, bye. Thank you, Hannah. Bye. Thank you, John. Thank you, Enjoy bye. your dinner. Bye, bye. Thank you, Ali. Bye, yeah. Ali. Bye, Ali. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, oh.